First off, I'd like to thank uh, Alexander and the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to, to talk today. Uh, the work I'm going to present today is uh, kind of a combination of things that Excel IMS ha has done, as well as in conjunction with, with Pfizer while I was with them and, and since, since I've left. Outline of what I'm going to talk about today is first an introduction to IML Billy, very, very brief. Uh, some of the recent developments in IMS that I think have uh, helped push this uh, technology in uh, the pharmaceutical industry. I want to compare it to other uh, separation technologies. I have a number of applications that I want to talk about in terms of how we can use these in the pharmaceutical industries and followed by a summary. First off, we have to have some way of ionizing the molecule to get it into the ion mobility spectrometer. Uh, goes through an ion gate into a drift tube gas against it. Molecules in our chain are separated by, by size and in shape. Kind of pictorial here of representation of what takes place. Uh, a bunch of different uh, molecules ionized. You can see their differences in size and shapes. Open the ion gate and then they're traveling down the, the drift tube, separating now by uh, size and shape. And what you get is something like this. And since I'm a chromatographer by training, back many years, this looks like a chromatogram to me. So it offered, you know, gave me ideas of how we could use IMS for, for separations uh, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, like I said, in, in my opinion, some of the two things that really help push uh, or can now push the uh, IMS technology back into the pharmaceutical industry are two things. One was the introduction of electrospray ionization uh, for being a way to introduce uh, ionized molecules into the drift tube. The second one was the improvement in instrumental design that resulted in increased resolving power. Uh, and here's some examples of uh, some explosives being separated at various resolving powers as the instrument uh, as the instruments have improved uh, and getting better and better separations. So the high performance high mobility spectrometer with an electrospray ionization source now provides an orthogonal separation method to, to HPLC. Kind of a comparison between high performance ion mobility spectrometry and other uh, separation technologies are shown here. Uh, much of the uh, theoretical place for solving power and so forth are very similar uh, now to what you get with uh, chromatographic conditions. Uh, however, the, the big thing is the separation time. Now you're talking about seconds versus minutes in, 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 in chromatography. This slide kind of shows the generality of, of, of IMS. Uh, you said it's not biased towards polarity of compounds. Uh, you have a single separation medium that you can separate them both polar and nonpolar compounds uh, at the same time. So this is kind of a, just an overlay of what, what we look like in terms of how generalized uh, ion mobility spectrometry can, can be. Uh, you have polarity, you can separate both hydrophobic and hydrophilic compact molecules. Also, you can separate volatility compounds on that. So it's a, it's a, uh, a generalized technology for, for separation of, of, of molecules. Uh, you don't have to switch columns. So you have one uh, separated in conditions that separate all types of compounds. IMS is, is a truly orthogonal separation technology to, to HPLC. Not just changing a column like you do in HPLC. Now you have a totally different separation mechanism. And your solvent consumption is, is reduced. Now you're starting to get to a green technology for uh, pharmaceutical analysis. Uh, just one quick example of showing that the separation of Triton X, uh, separation of the surfactant uh, polymers, uh, both by HPLC and by uh, HPIMS, uh, similar separations, but you have to kind of look at what the separation time is for HPLC. You're talking about 300 minutes or essentially five hours to get this sort of separation. We're now talking about 30 milliseconds to get the sep similar separation by high performance. Uh, IMS. 
uh, go through some of the applications. Um, in the work that we'll be describing, the, the instruments that, that we use were the ion scan uh, from Smith's detection, and then three types of systems from XIMS, the standard uh, ESI instrument, one with a mass spec, and now this is a modular type uh, standalone or connecting to a, uh, an HPLC uh, as a detector. Now at Pfizer, one of the very first things that uh, IMS was, was taking a look at was for cleaning verifications. Uh, Pfizer purchased a number of Smith's detections ion scan systems and uh, and again, the major advantage of this, at least when we took a look at it, was to compare it to the separation times uh, by IMS versus HPLC. So th the faster we can prove that the equipment is, is clean, the faster that we can use that equipment to go into and to make something else with. Uh, just a schematic of what the ion scan system is. You have a thermal disturber, you have nickel as the ionization, then they have, they have the drift tube. Now, at, at Pfizer, the ion scan systems were evaluated at several sites, both here and in, and in Europe, uh, but they were, not, they were found not to be suitable for following reasons at, uh, at Pfizer. had limited applicability. Uh, because it was a thermal disturber, you had to have something that was volatile. Mock if it's not volatile, you would not be able to introduce it into the uh, fl flow chamber. Uh, many times you had multiple peaks observed for a single peak or for a single component. Uh, we had no mass spec, so there's so, no way to identify what were the peaks that we were, we were taking a look at. It limited control over the method development parameters. Uh, we had carryover issues from sample to sample. A very small uh, dynamic range, usually on an order of less than two orders of magnitude. Uh, the Smith's detection used an internal calibrant uh, to get your drift times, uh, and that internal standard uh, calibrant limited the separation window. So it was always, always in your, your, your spectrum and it took away regions that you could use for separations. Uh, we also found there was variability between the instruments. Um, because Pfizer was a global company, it was very, very difficult to transfer these methods from one site to another uh, without uh, redeveloping them. Uh, and and one, again, another major reason was that it would have caused us to take work practices that we already had in place, both, uh, which would cost a lot more uh, resources and changes in our work practices in order to introduce this. So although it looked promising, it didn't really pan out for us at, uh, at Pfizer. However, this technology was used successfully by, by, by other companies. It's kind of a comparison then between the ESI versus the thermal disorder. Uh, in order for it to use uh, thermal desorption, you have to have compounds have to be, be volatile. Uh, and in the early stages of the development, yes, you might see something that's going to be volatile, but it's later stages in the API where you have the drug compound, they're not going to be volatilized uh, uh, very well when you heat it. Electrospray is a very soft type of ionization, very good for, for large molecules and all types of molecules. Uh, because now we have the ESI HPIMS system, you can now start to take a look at more con difficult compounds in terms of the cleaning validation uh, aspect. And just a quick, quick little table here of uh, the types of compounds that can be detected by uh, the ESI, but you can't do anything with these with the uh, thermal disorder. Example comparison of a Ranitekin uh, HCL. Uh, with the thermal disturber type uh, IMS system, uh, you have de decomposition of the molecule while you're trying to, you know, to heat it up enough to volatilize it, but you get, it also decomposes. Uh, with the ESI, you got, you got same two peaks here as you get by, by, by mass spec, uh, uh, the doubly charged and the singly charged. Got a nice separation of those. At XLIMS, we took a look at a number of compounds. Um, uh, that are on the market, trying to look at uh, 
what the linearity and limit of detection might be if we're going to use this as a cleaning uh, verification tool. All of them had very good linear, linear ranges, two to three orders of magnitude, all had good R-squared R values and good limits of detection and limits of quantitation. This was some work that XL IMS did in conjunction with uh, collaboration with uh, Behringer Ingelheim. Uh, they had four compounds that they wanted to take a look at for their, their cleaning verification. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with the thermal disorder instrument that they were using, uh, either it's not detectable because they weren't uh, ionized or it just couldn't volatilize them. The one that they were able to, to do by the thermal disorder was compared with the ESI and had very good ag agreement there. Whereas all the compounds could be uh, analyzed using the ESI HPIMS system. For those compounds then that uh, they, they couldn't use by uh, thermal de disorder, they developed HPLC assays uh, for, for two of them. Um, and we compared that with the uh, determination of a verification cleaning by HPLC and by ESI HPIMS. Uh, again, very good agreement all across the board. Again, the main thing in both of these uh, is going from 10 to 12 minutes down to less than one minute. So you have a bigger turnaround time in terms of verifying that your equipment is clean to go on to the next process. So in summary for the cleaning verification, validation types, uh, DSI, uh, HPIMS can analyze many types of compounds, APIs, intermediates, and, and we look at a number of the top selling drugs that are on the market and show that they are, uh, this was applicable for these compounds. Uh, also shown in conjunction with Behringer Engelheim is that uh, ESI PIMS performs well versus HPLC for cleaning verifications. Uh, more rapid analysis of, of your samples uh, and there's a very good set sensitivity and comparable resolving power that you saw in HPLC. Uh, ESI HPIMS has better performance over the more thermal desorption uh, IMS uh, systems. You can detect APIs and tech molecules that are thermally decomposed in the typical thermal desorption thing. Uh, it has better resolving power than the thermal desorber. Uh, sensitivity is in the picogram range and uh, the uh, I should say higher resolving by the greater linear dynamic range for the uh, ESI system. Next area I want to cover is reaction monitoring uh, as an application. Here is a palladium catalyzed emanation you know, reaction that, that uh, we have taken, taken a look at. And down here we see what, uh, what happens over a period of time as we take the samples out and analyze them by, by IMS. Initially, all we see is the two starting materials. After three hours, we start to see the uh, product showing up over here. And at 24 hours, now you're starting to get down to some very much decrease in the starting materials and a large increase in the, uh, in the, in the product. If you put a mass spec at the end of, uh, uh, of the system, now you start to get it further identification of the, the molecules that, that, that you're separating. Another uh, reaction monitoring was a microaddition followed by an inter intramolecular, uh, intermolecular cyclization. Two starting materials, just an intermediate, uh, and then it cyclizes to form the product. So it's a two-step reaction. At zero hours, you, you see the, the two starting materials show, showing up. Uh, at uh, four hours, now you start to see the uh, decrease in the uh, starting materials but now you start to see the, the intermediate uh, product. At, at 20 hours, you're starting to see now the formation of your product uh, along with the uh, intermediate. And after 72 hours, now you essentially see almost entirely has gone to the cyclized product. Uh, I'll point this out here, but I'll also again, if you notice, none of these molecules have a UV chromophore. <coughs> So HPLC is not going to be a very good way to, to follow this particular uh, analysis. <clears throat> a 
Another reaction monitoring uh, example that I have is uh, uh, formation of this cyclized imidazole type, type ring. Two starting materials can have two intermediates along the way, uh, giving you the, the product. Uh, initially, what you, what you see is your product as well as your two, two inter, uh, intermediates that are, that are formed. Uh, after 70, uh, 24 hours, you, the intermediates have, have disappeared. Now you have to, uh, your product. Here's an overlay showing the uh, disappearance of the, of the intermediates and the, where the uh, product goes. So you can get second information about what are the better understanding of, of, your, of, of your reaction. What are the intermediates along the way and, and where they're formed and how they might be uh, advantageous or, di or disadvantageous in the overall synthesis of the molecule. Uh, another thing about uh, IMS is that it's good for compounds that are chromatographically sensitive. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at the synthesis of, of amine. So you take an, an amine, be treat it with an aldehyde, and you get an imine. If you try to do this and that analyze this compound by HPLC, the minute it hits water, it'll go hydrolyze back go back to, to these two compounds. Uh, so we took a look at a number of, of aldehydes and several uh, amines, and in all cases, we were able to see uh, the imine uh, in, 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 in quite good, which means you know, this is a good way to look at intermediates that you can't analyze by, by HPLC. This is uh, work that uh, just before I left Pfizer, we started some collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Hill at Washington State University uh, to, to look at reaction monitoring uh, using IMS. Uh, this is a publication that's going to be issued very shortly in the International Journal of Mass Spectrometry. Uh, Professor Hill was taking a look at this reaction, which again, it, it's going into looking at the formation of, of, of an amine, uh, but it's also the uh, the ultimate product would be a reductive amination, so you use the amine that that's formed, reducing it to get the, the another, another amine. Uh, the reaction that Professor Hill took a look at was this aldehyde and then this amine, uh, and also there were some other byproducts that, that could could take place or side reactions, because it was done in the presence of methanol. You could get the combination. Uh, of the addition of the methanol to the aldehyde. Uh, because at, at the later stages we added sodium borohydride, you could get, if you still had an aldehyde present, that would be, be, be reduced. And this is the, the instrumentation that Professor Hill used in his, his studies. Now, one thing that came out of his study was that the two starting materials would not, could not be separated when you used uh, nitrogen as a, as a drift gas. When he switched to, to CO2, he was able now to, to separate the, the, the starting materials for, for, from each other. Uh, because he put a mass spec at the end of his, his system, now he's able to get a lot more information about what's taking place. He can be to identify and, and follow uh, those side reactions that, that we were talking about, the, the, the intermediate, the formation of the, uh, the acid aldehyde type compound, uh, and, and also then, then, then the product. So the combination of uh, VSI uh, with the mass spec is, is a very good tool for looking at reaction monitoring for those compounds that uh, uh, you can might not be aware that there's an intermediate there or that uh, you can't really analyze them by uh, normal chromatographic techniques. Here's another one that uh, you really can't do by chromatographically separation or analysis. It's an acid chloride. Again, the minute you put this in a reverse, say, reverse phase system, you're going to hydrolyze that back to the acid and you would not be able to see the, the acid chloride. As I indicated a little, little earlier, the, you don't need a UV chromophore in uh, IMS analysis um, because you're looking at, at the charge molecule. So here's an example of a reaction that is taking place uh, between these two uh, things. It's an alkylation reaction uh, to form this compound. 
none of the three compounds have a UV chromophore, yet we see good peaks for, for each of the three materials uh, by this. So in conclusion on the reaction monitoring, uh, proved to successfully monitor a number of rapid reactions, uh, a number of rapid uh, methods. Uh, do semi-quantitative analysis on them, and eventually I do quantitative analysis. Uh, we looked at quite a variety of reactions that have been monitored so far to date. Some of the advantages for the over HPLC for reaction monitoring, uh, you can not separate isomers because you're separating by size and shape. Uh, you can uh, analyze compounds that are chromatographically reactive. Uh, compounds with no chromophore, and again, we we'll emphasize that this is a green technology. You're not using uh, uh, solvents and so forth that you'd have to dispose of later. Because IMS is good for separation by size and shape, it's a very good technology for separation of, of isomers. Here we have two different, uh, two types of general isomers, constitutional, so here's a separation of some peptides that are slightly different. Down here are regioisomers where the R group, R1 group is on either of the two nitrogen and we could separate both of those. Uh, it's good for separation of stereoisomers for, for, for diastereomers, uh, separate those. And then for cis-trans isomers, we can be able to, to see those by uh, IMS. One of the newer things that we've come up with is, is using it as a detector for, for HPLC. Uh, separation of uh, analysis of these two pyrazole carbon nitride type compounds. Uh, looked at the total ion chromatogram. All you saw was, was one peak. But now if you put this in time mobility spectrometer, now you see the two peaks be, being separated. Uh, this is something that we just uh, worked out with Shimadzu. We can attach the uh, IMS system to their HPLC system. Uh, so now you have it both as a detector and as a secondary separation technology. So rather than having two DLC, where now you have to have two uh, chromatograms in, in place in order to, to do the analysis, you can now have just the one, and now you have a truly orthogonal separation. So not only are you detecting, but you're actually doing orthogonal separations on, on it. Uh, this could be some very powerful tool you know, going forward in the pharmaceutical industry. Another thing we have taken a look at was uh, anion analysis. So we put various uh, anions into the uh, mobility spectrometer. We were able to separate to nitrate, permanganate, chlorate, perchlorate. Uh, just to show that this is uh, something that we could possibly do in the future. The other thing we want to take a look at in the pharmaceutical industry was content uniformity. Uh, these are some proof of concept studies that we carried out at XLIMS. Uh, we wanted to we analyze a number of pharmaceutical compounds, uh, either individually or as mixtures, uh, look at various concentrations and with the goal of having an RSD of less than 3% so we can analyze the, the various uh, uh, pills and, and tablets that uh, we, we want to analyze. Uh, the compounds we analyze were, were a wide number of ones that are commercially available. Uh, here's an example of, of separation of acetaminophen and, and, and caffeine and, and, and tablets. Took a look at the reproducibility of the acetaminophen and in this particular case we were able to get uh, uh, an RSD of, of, of less than 3%. So we're still working on this and, and looking at the variables set that we need in order to ensure that we get this less than 3% at all times. You can also use uh, the ESI IMS for, for confirmation. Uh, for an IMS detector, you have your ibuprofen and you get your uh, drift time. Uh, kind of magnified here, but you can also then put up to mass spec and get a mass spec and for, for positive identification. This could all be done very, very quickly. Plus, you can also use a drift time, just like you do in HPLC for the retention time as, uh, as an ID.
The last theory they were just starting to get into is, is, is dissolution, and we've had two studies that we were ongoing right, right now. One is to take a look at the Benadryl. We were able to do some linearity, reproducibility, and what effects excipients might have on the uh, results. And we looked at aspirin, just a linearity. You know, in, in Benadryl, we had good, good uh, linearity between 50 parts per million and 5 parts per million. Took a look at the reproducibility, uh, injecting the same sample, uh, and we got very good uh, RSDs for repeated injection to the same 5 parts per million you know, concentration sample. And we have an overlay of the Benadryl sample and the uh, diphenylhydramine HCL uh, to show uh, that uh, the signal intensity decreases for the diphenylhydramine sample. Uh, so some excipients are, could be competing for the ionization process, but anyway, it's lowering the, the, the sensitivity of the uh, method for that particular one. So that, that's something that we have to take a look at and, uh, and see what the effect excipients are going to have on, on, the, on the signals we, we get. For aspirin, again, we had a very good uh, linearity from one part per million to 100 part per million. And over here, uh, I just show the overlays of the, the various separate or the various signals that we had for the uh, aspirin signal at, at the various con, uh, concentrations. Uh, so the whole department is probably going to be about the best we're going to be able to do. Now, when you compare this to an HPLC system, uh, HPIMS is, is lower cost and it is a green technology. Uh, reduce the amount of toxic chemicals, uh, damage the environment, depends, also you have to, don't have to dispose of. Uh, reduces health and safety hazards for the analysts. You don't have to be uh, exposed to the solvents and so forth. Saves money because now you're cutting down on disposal costs and you're not purchasing solvents, or at least it's not as much. Uh, saves time and labor by using faster techniques, and you don't have to buy HPLC columns. You don't have to have a wide uh, number of columns on hand. So overall, it, it's, it's, it may cost the same to buy the instrument, but the, in terms of the usage, it, uh, costs go way down uh, over time. Now, in summary, in terms of what we think are the advantages of the high-performance IMS, uh, speed of analysis, uh, time cycle for each reaction reduced to rapid on-bench analysis, very proficient then for looking at parallel uh, synthesis, online monitoring, or raw material uh, analysis. There's minimal method uh, development that goes into it. Uh, the instrument parameters that you need uh, to, to help you separate them are, are very easy to change, and you can do that from a computer. Uh, it reduces the need to screen the high, high, uh, a number of HPLC columns that normally would have to take place in an analytical lab. <coughs> Provides additional chemical information besides chemical uh, physical property, gives approximate molecular weight. Uh, because it's based on size and shape as well as somewhat molecular weight, and provides information about the tertiary structures of, uh, of the molecules. Um, IMS is, is a truly orthogonal technique to HPLC. Uh, analysis of the compounds them for that are chromatically sensitive. Uh, you can look at molecules that are don't, do not have a chromophore. Uh, and they're very well suited then for separation of, uh, of isomers. It's indicated capital investment is comparable to what you would pay for an HPLC, but significantly high savings when you look at the operational costs for the consumables uh, that you have to go through. And then reduction of consumables, again, uh, separation is achieved in filtered air, there's no elution solvent, and there's minimal routine maintenance. And, and of course, there's no uh, cost for have to do for replacement of HPLC columns. So again, we're saying it's a green technology and you don't have to worry about the solvent disposal costs. And with that, thank you for your, for your attention and open up to questions if you have any. Sorry, yes. 
an excipient is you have your active drug and you have to mix it with something to maybe be able to form a tablet or a pill. And so it's usually like cellulose or magnesium stearate, something along those lines that you can compress it then into a pill that, that you know, the patient can, can take. So, so excipients is everything else besides the active drug. Right. Yeah. Yes. It's Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. So then, uh, which peak is the Okay. The the blue is the Benadryl, so that's the mixture. So it has the excipients, and then black peak is the uh, diphenylhydramine. You can see the big signal for the black just below it is the. Uh, there's the blue for that. So you got quite a bit of. Reduction in the signal because of the excipients that are, that are there. Uh, don't know. It could be the excipients. Could be the, you know, the solvents and so forth that we're, we're using the analysis. No, the active one is, is, is right here. Sorry, I should have labeled that. Yes. No, this is this is two runs. One of just Benadryl by itself, so that would be the blue one. And then the other was diphenylhydramine, the black one, and they're overlaid over each other after. They're run separately, but overlaid. No, sorry. No, that's an overlay. Because XLIMS has, has uh, done work to increase the resolving power, uh, so now it's time to take a look at uh, high performance LC. So we're tr tr putting the same kind of notation on, on ours. It's high performance or high yeah. IMS. Yeah. No, no, no. It, 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 HP stands for high performance. IMS and HPLC is high performance LC. Okay, so the next question is, do you I guess I, I guess you could also say I don't know if that's what you intended, but um, is there a difference between high performance and high performance LC? Because the high performance LC. No, so that was just just high performance, and again stressing the the, the resolving power. The liquid sample. So, uh, all right. so, sample. Yes. You would do it. You do an uh, electrospray ionization. So you have the solvent going in through through a needle. Electrospray ionization. And then that spray, the ionized particles go into the drift tube. Uh, okay. So high performance is It's the, the uh, on the drift tube side, so you have better resolving power. We have not done that. We we have more. Ours is more of a. How do we get it out there to industry to, to, to so that we can use it for for analysis in the pharmaceutical industry without all the rest of the stuff that's going. And I'm sure eventually it would be used for something like that. But we haven't done that. We haven't uh, l l looked at that, 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 that yet. Uh, and a lot of these were just you know, proof of concept with, with uh, some initial uh, collaborations with, with a few companies uh, just to show that it now can be used over a wide variety of compounds. Uh, 
now she has electric spray. Uh, so we're hoping, you know, to work with other other companies and so forth, so that this could be used for other things as well. Well, we can wash the system out after each, each run, which we, we, which we will do. I don't think we've seen much overlap on you know, in terms of, of, of that. Any question on cleaning validation? Yeah. yeah. Um, don't know where this is going to take us, but it's just something that was tried in the lab and found that you could in fact see separation and uh, identification of the you know the larger uh, anions. Um, but you have to that would be a problem that you have to make sure that you're cleaning out on the electro spray tip. I think they're going to be complementary. Uh, I've used both of, 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 of the systems. In fact, we, we used Raman to look at the imine reactions. Uh, but uh, this is something that a chemist could have right in his laboratory with him, and so he wouldn't have to have you know, the extra things of vibrational you know, probes that, that you use. Plus, you'd have to use chemometrics a lot of times in, in uh, uh, looking at uh, vibrational probes. Um, but I think it would be complementary. Uh, you, know, you can use them either way. Uh, thing with the probe, it's, it's real time. Uh, with an IMS, it's near real time. You know, near time, but it's not real time. The temperature that I was talking about was for the thermal desorber, that you had to apply heat to in order to volatize the molecules so that it could get into the chamber where it's going to be ionized. By using ESI, you don't have to have that heat, so it's just normal electrospray ionization. Does that answer? Yeah. At least the extra electrospray, yeah. I'll, I'll turn to my colleagues. That was with the ion scan. No, we had no carryovers on uh, on that one. You, you, like I said, you can you can wash the you know system out between uh, between runs, and it's all very quickly. We haven't seen the overlapping, so I mean. Uh, Carry over. I, I, I guess I don't follow the question. Okay. We can talk later.